Welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It is the 27th of February, and we do expect a few other people to be joining us as we go, but we thought we'd get going. Um, the uh, show tonight is uh, focusing on uh, connected learning, uh, focusing on what is connected learning, focusing on some of the ways that we um, have observed connected learning in Stephen Ritz's uh, life and teaching. And um, Joel, maybe you could uh, kick us off with uh, telling us a little bit about um, how you came to, I assume it was you, uh, putting um, Stephen's TED Talk up um, right at the beginning of the Connected Learning Inquiry Group site. Okay. Sure. So, so Stephen, what we're doing right now is we've got like, like a five or six month program, this inquiry group taking place on this website where it's like a, it's pretty much just a discussion site where we're trying to examine the principles of connected learning that have been defined by um, by the, the, the digital media um, digital media and learning hub and in doing so we're kind of pouring through right so Jennifer Wolven who couldn't be with us and I um, we were talking about it and I and I had about how to set up and I and I remember this great talk that I saw back in the summertime uh, about a guy in a classroom in the Bronx who has this dynamic program and has his kids doing amazing things and when I thought about connected learning like that was the immediate immediate classroom that I kind of gravitated towards and I said you know what what a great way to start off our conversation by taking a look at this piece in common taking a look at the story you shared during that TED talk and kind of using that as a launching off pad uh, to kind of like use that to be the story we kind of I don't know hold as a barometer um, we see your kids that talk doing amazing things, you know, being connected to the community in multiple different ways, making stuff, um, having real purpose. And, you know, I, I, I question one of the reasons why I got into this, Stephen, is because I question consistently, like, how, many, how much purpose do my students have in my English classroom? Like, is what we're doing authentic? Does it matter? So when I saw what you guys were doing over there, I said, wow, that's really excellent. Um, what a great talk, and then you're able to join us, so the world is good. <laughs> so welcome, Stephen. Stephen, are you there? No, you just rejoined. Uh, yeah, you just rejoined. Okay. The other one will disappear. So if you're having some difficulty, we'll just keep going now. <laughs> so, so welcome. We just, uh, Joel just gave you a great introduction there, by the way. So Can you hear me now? We can hear you just fine. Okay, great. Yeah. Thanks. Well, thank you kindly. I wish I could have heard it, you know, <laughs> but that's okay. So he said he talked about how connected you are with uh, the community, with your students, with authentic learning, with making things. Uh, do you want to just briefly introduce yourself, and then we'll get into it a little bit as we go here? Sure. I'm Steve Ritz. I'm from the Bronx. I am a special ed teacher by trade. Um, and I just found that I've always had a different kind of classroom for many years. I've always been a different kind of teacher, and I've always strived to just push the walls of the classroom out into the community as far as possible and bring the community in as much as possible. Um, it's taken a lot of different manifestations. When I was younger, it had to do with rap music. It had to do with sports. Um, in the 90s, it had to do with animals and um and physical activities and understanding our environment. I used to do stuff with, uh, I was the guy who put the kids into the New York City subway uh, and made them hit every stop on one token before we had metro cards, uh, you know, things like wait, that. Wait, say that, what was that again? Uh, I wanted the kids to be able to figure out how to get to every single stop in the New York City subway system. Yeah. Uh, only one token over a course for a weekend and never leaving, you know, understanding closed systems and connectedness. So we did this mm. school trip for a weekend in the New York City subways. <laughs> uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, some people didn't necessarily think that way, but uh, I've outlasted them career-wise, so I'm thrilled to say that. I've done a lot of writing projects where we connect kids to, the, to their own environment, kind of, I believe, every kid has a unique story to tell and people are willing to tell their story. Um, it changes the way they see themselves, the world, and school. And, you know, quite literally by accident, uh, I got into growing and, and, and the whole kind of green concept and certainly um, not as an interest of mine, but more reflection of their basic curiosities. 
And uh, lo and behold, I guess now a good almost uh, eight years, nine years later, here I am, uh, 30,000 pounds of vegetables later in the South Bronx. Rather remarkable. So we'll have to get into that a little more. Um, if you don't mind, Stephen, I want to um, have the other folks introduce themselves here sure. as well. Um, Chris Sloan? Yeah, and so we are introducing ourselves with uh, examples of our students' connectedness, right? Yeah. Thank you for remembering that. Yes. Okay. Uh, so my name is Chris Sloan, and I teach high school English and media in Salt Lake City, Utah. And um, so, you know, uh, the way that one example of how my students were connected today is uh, my photographers. You know, in the old days, I used to teach photography where it was a dark room, and you would develop things and map them and, you know, hang them on walls, which is great. Uh, but now um, my photographers find a lot more energy uh, or a different kind of energy like um, putting their photography out into a community like Flickr, joining groups, uh, connecting with others who have similar interests, and then also then putting their work on Youth Voices and talking about it with other teens, uh, whether they're photographers or not. So their entry into their composition in this particular case is through image. So that's one way. So, and, what, what, and what's the project they're working on now? Some sort of uh, my hometown? Yeah, New York Times has um, a thing that everybody should be interested in. Um, on their Lens blog, um, it's called My Hometown. And they're going to, um, they're patterning it after the Farm Security Administration photography from the 1930s. And they're asking all high school students to document their hometowns, their communities, in ways that make sense to them. And then the New York Times is going to put uh, on their Lens blog um, all the photography of high schoolers around the world who want to participate uh, into an interactive map um, of just kind of one moment in time, um, but high schoolers documentary of their communities, kind of like Walker Evans and Ed Stryker and those people in the 1930s who mm -hmm. documented America through the Farm Security Administration. So I would say, you know, one way for everybody to get connected is to maybe look at that thing called My Hometown with the New York Times on their Lens blog. It's very cool. What, what's nice about that is you're connecting to history and mm -hmm. to politics and to your own community at this at the moment, so mm -hmm. and to each other. There are lots of connections going on there. Cool. Uh, Najib, could you introduce yourself? It's looking in the yes. other direction, just as I said that. Welcome. Thank you. Um, so I'm the um, technology integration specialist uh, for the elementary school at uh, the American International School in Caracas. Um, one example that we have uh, connected learning uh, with the second grade, we've we've joined a project called I Spy Community Projects. Uh, which was created by Jennifer Peterson. She's a tech director at the Graded School in Brazil. And she's joined um, several classrooms, first, second, and third graders around the world, where they take pictures of their communities. Uh, they go outside, take pictures, um, and then upload those pictures through voice threads, um, leaving comments as clues. And students from other schools are then required to, to guess and think about you know, where this could be and compare and contrast it to, to their communities. Yeah, I did see that. Very cool. Nice. How's that going? What's that look like? The project, it's, it's, um, it's, it goes very well. We do it at the beginning when, when uh, the kids work on their community units um, in different grade levels. So it's usually around September, October, um, and the kids have a lot of fun with it. And it, ex it extends outside the classroom as well, which is... Uh, Huh? I was going to ask, are you guys on vacation right now, or are you back already? No, we're not. We follow the, the Northern Hemisphere schedule, oh, yeah. so we go from August to June. Yeah. Got it, got it, got it. Cool. So, I, and, and Stephen, um, I, I've watched uh, quite a few videos that you've been on, and I know you're a big talker, and we'll, we'll just let you talk here in a little bit. But um, just to introduce myself here, um, and, and the idea, what I wanted to point to was a kind of extended um, piece of writing that one of my students, Dean, uh, finished today. It's actually on the front page of youthvoices.net right now, but you could also find it right at the top of um, youthvoices.net slash um, Malcolm X. And it's a, it's a um, collage piece, which is uh, a term and a procedure that we're borrowing from Peter Elbow and trying to think about it in a digital framework. 
But one of the wonderful things and one of the reasons I wanted to call it a connected learning experience was that he ends up putting into this collage of writing, um, writing that he did to another student who had read the autobiography of Malcolm X mm, four or five years ago. Um, and that, that work is still there on Youth Voices. And um, so he's connecting to other students. He's connecting um, lots of different kinds of, of writing together. Um, so that's uh, one of the quick examples I wanted to give. And Chris uh, Sloan, I wanted to kind of point to that as, as in our dialogue about how to think about kind of publishing and getting these longer pieces up um, mm -hmm. at the end of a research project. Any rate, so that's how I'll introduce myself here. And again, um, if there's anybody over in the chat room who wants to jump in, you can see there's room here for you to do that. Please feel free to do that. And if anybody's, and a couple people said they would be late and that they would be coming, and we, so we're kind of expecting that to happen as we go. Um, Stephen. Why don't you tell us more of your story? So, and, and start us off with a TED Talk, because you were at a different school then, and kind of uh, tell us. I'm also curious about, you said you're a special ed teacher, but as I was snooping around your bio and stuff, there was something about being a biology teacher or something, too. How do, <laughs> just okay. tell us more about you and how, yeah. Okay, so what question do you want first? Because the um, jump in. <laughs> I am not okay. Well, let me tell you what. I'm really not a bio teacher um, <laughs> at all. I have collaboratively taught um, via inclusion model, um, living environment, biology, earth science, um, all that stuff. But I am by no means a scientist or a science person. Uh, I've given a lot more credit for that than I truly deserve. I think the best way to describe me would probably be to say I'm the oldest sixth grader you're ever going to meet. So I get excited by lots of things and hope that kids come to me with a certain level of excitement and I can come to them with a certain level of excitement and we can catapult that into spheres of success that neither group has ever imagined. And that seems to be the way I work. But make no doubt about it, I am no means a, a science teacher per se. Although, you know, there were years where if you were to look on my program line, I would be listed as a science teacher. Uh, as for the TED Talk, the TED Talk um, was rather interesting. I, I got there by happen chance, so to speak. Mm -hmm. I never really aspired to do a TED Talk per se. I had been speaking not long ago, uh, not long before that, at the New York Academy of Medicine, just highlighting some of the things that were happening in my classroom as a result of what I was doing. And really all I was doing was hoping to get kids involved. But along the way, like a lot of good stuff happened. Kids lost weight. We started taking ownership of food, blah, 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 blah. So, some, so the people, my good friends at NIAM suggested that I apply to speak at, at TEDx. And lo and behold, I did. Um, remarkably, I was determined. I never, never had done much public speaking before that. Certainly never in a, in a TED forum. And I was just mindful that my background is really literacy, I was just determined to get out there and share my kid's story. And I did that remarkably with 345 slides in 12 minutes. So my job was to have like a flip book of slides that would tell a story um, regardless of anything that I might or might not babble in, in and throughout and during those 12 minutes. Remarkably, at the TED Talk, up until the day before, I had been um, in the hospital for quite some time with some with an ex unexpected uh, kind of hospitalization stay. So literally, I took that stage with um, two bags attached to my body and just determined to press play and, and see where it went, mindful that the, I felt that the slides that I had put together would tell the story. And, you know, it really took off kind of virally. The talk migrated from TEDx to TED. Um, so if anybody's out there and hasn't seen it, please go see it. We're hoping it continues to go viral. Is it, is it a year ago or two years yeah, ago? Yeah, a year ago. Just one, one year, year ago. Now, I mean, since it hit, I mean, on the te on the TEDx site, it had like, I think, 50,000 hits. And then now on the TED site proper, it's over 400,000. Yeah. Um, it's rather remarkable. I, I'm humbled and I'm flattered. But um, I think it's, 
you know, who knows what it is. I, I always say this is our moment. Uh-oh. Oh, no. Gotten frozen there again. Well, yeah, we'll hope he comes back. Scott, do you want to jump in while, while we're waiting for him to come back? I'm still fighting technical difficulties, Paul. I can't even see you right at the moment. So We can hear you, though. Okay. Can you, can can you see, see me you. Okay. okay? We can indeed. All right. Um, I really don't have a whole lot to add. I'm, I'm only getting about 20% of what's going on. So, so how... Uh, well, wh one of the ways we introduced ourselves by, was by talking about connected learning we've seen recently. Mm, well, I'm getting into a new adventure working with um, a group called Hacker Scouts, a group of teens and tweens that are... Uh, it's kind of like a makerspace type of thing. And they're going to get together and do science stuff and electronic stuff. And they're going to meet with them for the first time on Sunday. So we'll see how that goes. I should have a good report for you on that next week. Hmm. So what are you doing to prepare for that? Um, I'm going to go in open-minded and empty. They, they have a plan. They have a, a sort of a lesson thing they're going to work on. I think it's uh, mousetrap cars or something this time. I'm, I'm kind of there as the a co-teacher, a support person. I, I'm the the technical person with the electronics. That's where they need me the most. So we'll see how it goes. Kelsey and I will go, and we'll see where we end up. Welcome. I was I was wondering where you guys had been. So mm -hmm. glad glad to see you um, coming around here. Stephen, are you back? Are you back there? Can you hear us? Stephen. Ritz, hello, Mr. Ritz. Hello. Looks like he's frozen. He's still frozen. Okay, well, <laughs> who has a night? Uh, Stephen Ritz has joined it once again. So we're just uh, quickly getting Stephen back. Stephen, looks like you're back now. Hi there. Hello? I see him twice. We did practice this. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, well, as a viewer, go ahead, Chris. Go ahead. <laughs> as a viewer of this video, yeah, go ahead. Um, you know, I mean, um, I was really, you know, it's an inspirational thing. Um, and and again, like you know, Maker, I noticed um, this year at the National Writing Project, there was this this undercurrent of a lot of making. You know, there's a lot of interest in in making things in education and. Um, like I was really impressed just with the stuff that his students make, you know, the the food for the community, and and uh, so if and when we get even back, um, I'd like to hear a little bit more about, um, you know, how that all started too. Mm -hmm. All right, looks like we're trying to get back in. So, Joe, you have any thoughts? Um, yeah, you know what? Um, it is interesting to think about okay. the power in that story. We're, we're, yeah, we'll, we'll wait for you. Um, you know, I, th I think if I think about all these, these TED Talks, these Ken Robinson TED Talks, these... Uh, TED Talks from educators or, or that, 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 that kind of go viral and the story is always you know remarkably similar it's like somebody takes a new approach to education which you know which makes sense and fights against the system that we all kind of operate in you know this that, that there's always this model that um, that uh, completely turns on our on its, on its head everything all this kind of like enfranchised stuff that we deal with on a daily basis. Um, so it's, it's interesting just to think about, you know, why did this video go viral? What's so powerful about the story? Um, and there are so many interesting things about that. The, um, you know, the kids in the community, the different approach to learning, the practicality of it all, the dream. It's, it's, it's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Nikel, welcome. Hey, how's it going? Go, go, go. Another TED alumnus here, uh, and when you saw that Stephen was joining us, you quickly said, "I'll come too." So welcome, it's so nice yeah. to have you here. Oh, I recognize that voice. 
All right, Stephen, welcome back. I think I lost you again. Do no, you, no, you're... we're okay. All right, well, I I'm can't. I'm frozen now. Even that's okay. <laughs> All right, so as we go here, um, we'll keep we'll keep trying to make it go. You know, um, one of the things that um, whoever can uh, join in on this conversation, one of the things that you just said, Joel, that I wanted to bring up as um, respectfully and uh, cautiously as possible, but. Um, Stephen has been at a couple of different schools since the TED Talk, right? So um, it's it's interesting to see, and and there are I could list the three or four other examples. Um, the the um, Project H stuff in North Carolina. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Another TED Talk um, where people are doing really amazing things. But it tends to be like I wonder how it gets integrated into the big system. Sometimes, you know, I I, I worry that um, I worry that that we get pushed to the margins. And and yeah, we we you know there are all these downloads, but do we get to affect the big system? Sometimes is one of my one of my bigger questions around all this too. Stephen, are you back? Yeah, I believe so. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're good. Great, thanks. So, well, I guess again, here's here's a generous way to ask the question, which is, um, how how um, how much impact do you think you're having? I mean, obviously, you're having a big impact with the kids you're working with and so forth. But, like, how does it? Interface with the traditional school kind of question. You know what I mean? Is that is that a fair uh, the question? Hundred, that's the hundred thousand dollar question. Um, I would like for it to integrate more, and sometimes you really have to find places to do great work that are ready to really embrace a different. I mean, I'm not doing anything that anybody else who goes to work and tries their best every day is not doing. I'm just doing it a little differently. Um, but that said, you've got, oh, God. <laughs> oh, well, so he's doing it differently. Valerie, welcome. Can you speak yet? Okay. You're, this is the night to test the hangout. Okay. Valerie, we need, we, we don't have much sound yet. We can't hear you. All right, so she'll work on that. Nikhil, do you have any thoughts on that notion of these wonderful experiments that are going on, and and how you know how they butt up against the system, kind of thing? I hope I'm back. You are. Okay, I don't know why. There's, there's two of you now. Really? Yeah. Don't worry about it. One <laughs> of you will go. Better away. looking than the other. <laughs> I always say, as long as you both say the same thing, we're okay. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so no, I was just going to say that, um, I mean, what I've noticed is that um, in in the general media and the general space that I, I think there is this kind of necessity um, and this craving for something really different to happen to school. Um, I mean, I, we, we saw with last night with Sugata Mitra winning the TED Prize, um, and that was just a major, major achievement. I think it was, um, it could, I think that it signals that people are finally waking up um, and realizing that school is becoming a very outdated, uh, very obsolete, um, and is simply not working. Um, so I, I think there are these great experiments around the country. The problem is is linking them all together um, as well as broadcasting it. Because I mean, re recently there was a project um, in Massachusetts called Independent Project, um, and I can send you the link to that that film, uh, and it was an Ashoka fellow who made up the um, the video, and it's just extraordinary just seeing um, what happened in this school. So basically there was these about this group of uh, high school students that started their own school within this high school um, where they basically got to do whatever they wanted. Um, they learned whatever they wanted, they work with anybody, uh, and then they at each week they had to present what they accomplished and what they learned um, during that time period. Um, and it's it's just expanded in the school. It's been extraordinary, and I think these types of experiments and these projects need to be initiated and and put out to the mainstream public 
because they're often just seen as an outlier or something that only tailors to high, uh, really high, uh, very motivated students or in very wealthy neighborhoods, and that's simply not the case. Did you say you're going to put a link to that somewhere? Yeah, I'm going to find that. Yeah. Okay. So, Stephen, maybe tell us more of your story, if you don't mind, um, about you know, I did I did check out the Norwood uh, Times, I think, which is a local newspaper, which said that you were being sort of uh, pushed into or invited into the basement just as you were giving the TED talk at the school where you were, and then you went to another school, and now you're at another school, and so you've been kind of moving around since that TED talk. I don't, I mean. And and I just mean to say that to say that at the same time you have this amazing project going on and the, the Bronx Green Machine and so forth. So I'm just wondering how you're balancing the the sort of in schoolness and out of schoolness. Um, it's 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 always a struggle. I think you know it was very eloquently stated. In a lot of ways, school is failing, and it, schools are failing our kids. I don't think we have to be rocket scientists to to see that. But yet there's this need for systemic change um, that everybody can understand. And I'm somewhat of a, of a disruptive force as well. So you've got to really, again, be in a place that embraces the work you do within the mission and the context of, of the school that you're in. The school that gave birth to this program, it, it, it never anticipated, nor did I. Um, and, you know, I work for, for a very disciplined, rigorous, intense principal who really inherited a school that was not in good shape and really came in with a very strong vision to turn it for better or for worse into a college readiness school, um, which I embrace. And along I came with this program that I never ex expected that really was more of a, a career technical education and really motivated those who we might not even want to be at that school. So it became somewhat disruptive and also it became space intense realize in New York City we're very pressed for space so in some regards you know the classroom that I was using was needed to serve more kids over more periods across the entire day um, and in a space constrained system like the New York City school system serving as many kids as possible as efficaciously as possible is very important to a principal so I respect that on the flip side being able to move you know your most marginalized kids into spheres of success that we never imagined is equally as important to me. And, you know, balancing that is a tough act, but mindful that, you know, the principal has to steer the ship for the school. I understood why I was moved to the basement. Did I like it? No. Um, <laughs> did I accept it? Yes. And when the opportunity for me to move elsewhere and really grow this program in a school and in a setting that embraced it, really, that, that was attractive to me because at the end of the day, you know, I want my reach to exceed my grasp. I want to inspire not only as many students as possible, but really as many teachers as possible. So I did leave and went to Harlem. The reality of, of, of Harlem is that it was not for me in terms of commute. It was taking me far too much time to go to work and come to work, and those were lost hours. And again, at the end of the day, I'm much more about the Bronx um, and staying connected to this Green Bronx machine and the borough and the people and the community that gave birth to this initiative. So I'm thrilled that I was able to do something in, Har in Harlem and, and grow the program for me, but also grow the initiative for the school. I've been following the progress of the school and they're doing a whole lot of urban farming and urban ecology stuff. And literally I lay laid in, left in place um, interest with the kids and interest with faculty and some tangible projects that have attracted new faculty and I am home in my beloved community of the South Bronx, um, working on a K-12 to and beyond model in the community that needs it most and gave birth to my work. So at the end of the day, you just, you know, I'm not one to ask for permission. I'm certainly not going to beg for, for, for forgiveness, but I, I'm going to keep it moving and keep it moving in ways that impact a whole lot of people. And at the end of the day, that's what I'm about. What's the K-12 initiative? I'm at a high leadership charter school. Um, in the Hunts Point community, and you know, I haven't been, I jokingly say, I, I have a daughter and I'm waiting for college acceptances. I haven't been in an elementary school since, you know, I was there for her. So being able to embed the concept of sustainability, conservation, environmental stewardship, and marrying it 
with uh, food access and food justice issues in the poorest congressional district in America, and one of the most food challenged environments in America, is really stellar to me. So being able to do things like, you know, teach little kids vowel consonant blends by using something called calabasa that we can grow in class and cook it and eat it and grow it to me is just spectacular. And on the flip side, being able to, you know, I'm the luckiest guy on the planet, I got to tell you, to be able to do things that engage the most marginalized kids and the most intelligent kids in ways that, you know, really create a health and wellness across the curriculum in term, and in terms of their own personal health and wellness um, that help mitigate the environment um, in a community that needs it desperately. I'm just the luckiest guy on the planet. So to me, it, it's very near and dear to me. And, and, and really, my South Bronx community has always been very supportive of my work. So to be able to do that and kind of attract attention and notoriety for the community and dole out resources accordingly in my home community is spectacular for me. I'm real excited about it. So I, ha I haven't moved on. I think I've moved up. Yeah, I, that, very well put, I think. Tell us about the Green Bronx Machine. How did that uh, start and what's its purpose? And Well, the Green Bronx Machine was literally, again, about being connected. And I had these gentlemen come in who were very involved in, and much more to your interests, you know, media, technology, and we're talking about, to my kids, who had no concept of what any of this was, ways that we could green our borough. Simult and they were very tech savvy, very media savvy, and they initially started this Green Bronx machine. And I, on the other hand, had this burgeoning workforce. And I've always said that the greening of America starts with the pockets, um, translates to the hearts, and then the minds. So I was developing this workforce around so, real can, uh, Sorry, Stephen. I, I'm going to ask you to break that down. What's that mean? Starts with the pockets. Starts with the pockets. It means that, listen, living wage is real important to my kids. And, you know, hip national accounts, the bank account in your pocket. Um, I find that a lot of my kids are disconnected from school because they don't see any connection or correlation between what we're told to do and what we're learning and the ability to make, you know, to make a living wage. So when I learned about this technology, and of course I learned about it from an ornamental standpoint, long before I was growing food, I was just fascinated by the cool factor. Again, tying into my oldest sixth grader mentality. When I saw 2,000 plants in a 10 foot by one foot vertical wall, I said, I need this in my class. This is cool. Um, and cool it was, and cool it is, and here we are. So the kids were, were taken to it because they realized that they could make money doing it. Um, installing this technology, um, you know, putting it in, maintaining it. So that was the hook, so to speak. Um, I had these very tech-savvy, media-savvy, um, intellect-heavy guys coming to my class who had initially started the initial Green Bronx machine, and they were connecting writing and community advocacy and education and blogging and film and technology, all the stuff that obviously I'm not adept at to what we were doing in class, and the kids were fascinated. Um, and they came in once a week, and it was like the highlight. Meanwhile, you know, we had this little nutty professor coming in, our friend Evan, who was bombarding the kids with thousands of images, thousands of websites. And, you know, if you, you take enough as a home run hitter, if you take enough swings, you're going to hit them out of the park. And lo and behold, he did. So we gave birth to this thing called the Green Bronze Machine. And as we emerged as an employment training work site, um, in a vocational readiness program, we, we took ownership of the name with his, with his permission. The kids, you know, asked if we could, and I asked Evan if we could, and lo and behold, we gave birth to the Green Bronze Machine, um, determined to bring it to a city across America, you know, coming to a city near you soon, because what we're doing is replicable. Um, it involves moving kids who are apart from to becoming a part of, and it involves technology and self-sustaining income-generating machines uh, you know, revenue generators that really are, are very replicable, make a lot of dollars and a whole lot of sense. And to me, at the end of the day, that's what it's about. So that's way inspiring, but I'd but, like you to break it down a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> like like I, if I'm a teacher, I, yeah, I am a teacher in the Bronx. How could I join the Green Bronx machine? And if, um, you know, down there in uh, New Orleans, Valerie Burton, if she wants to join the Green Bronx machine, uh, how does how does that happen? What does a teacher do to get involved? What do kids do? Okay, well, I got to tell you, the whole thing is kid-driven. So you okay. know, what, what the teachers do is conduct the orchestra. Um, you know, and what do you do with the kids? You let them play the music, and you tell certain ones when to turn it up and when to turn it down. But at the end of the day, you got to make your principal happy. So let's, if we're talking about it from a school perspective, 
Um, you know, make your principal happy. Align it to curriculum. Listen, you thought I was a biology teacher. I'm not, but I realized that with plants. When I taught kids to pollinate plants instead of each other, I was really covering asexual <laughs> reproduction. And when my kids started really knocking out region scores, that was the game changer because long before this, I realized I could, you know, roll back tsunamis and undo earthquakes, and that would be great and probably even cure AIDS if I found the right kid. And the chancellor would say, that's great. What about test scores? So I figured out that if I could do something that engaged kids to pass the test and do well on the test, I could probably do whatever I wanted. And that's literally kind of what happened in so many regards. So Stephen, I'm going to press you a little bit. So what do I do what, as a student? I go to the, what, what's the website I go to? How do I get involved? Okay, well, we have a Facebook page and, and we're still evolving. So on the evolutionary chart of man, we are moving from the left to the right. Um, so what do we do? Well, we have this, this Facebook page with We Connect, and the kids maintain the Facebook page. They tell me who to reach out to because right now there's still only one Steve and there's only one Lizette, my wonderful wife. So we are experiencing growing pains of epic proportions, which we never expected, but that's a good problem to have. Um, we're looking at becoming a pencil partner with certain schools, so what we do is replicable for teachers who want it. But again, at the end of the day, what's going to make this sustainable in schools is being a viable force for engagement, you know, for teacher education and, and getting kids to pass the test. Make no doubt about it. Engaging kids in school, you know, being part of common core standards. You know, I don't expect kids to be farmers. I expect them to read, write, blog, do the math, offer outstanding customer service and be able to, you know, get me connected to the internet so I can get through an hour with you. <laughs> and they're doing uh, can I, can Jump I in. Yeah, please jump in. Welcome, Monica, by the way. Because, um, you know, I'm an English teacher, too, and, and I've heard you talk about literacy. And, you know, if I watch the TED Talk, you know, I and, you know, I read stuff about you, I'd think, like, well, here's, like, a science teacher. He's he's teaching kids about gardening. But, you know, can you say more about the literacy? Because it seems like that's a real powerful force here that, uh, you know, that the, the plants and the food and everything is really um, – how did that – how do their test scores improve? What's the connection? Is it motivational or is it the things they do through gardening and the business end that? A lot of it is motivational. Make no, I mean, listen, I think clearly there's an academic problem in America. I think all of us on, on, on this conversation know that there, there, is an, there is an achievement gap. But I think a lot of the achievement gap could be attributed to an engagement gap. So when kids are engaged in something, they're willing to do more. And like the sign on my door says, you know, bring the body, the brain will follow. And, you know, I have this vehicle that gets kids to bring their body, and lo and behold, I have their brain. Now, what got me indoors was that I really myself hated being outdoors. You know, I didn't like the sun. I didn't like bugs. I don't like weeds. I don't like, you know, people stealing my tomatoes. I don't like, you know, mitigating the community. Um, I, I love my community, but, you know, try managing six acres of community gardens. It's a lot. And teach classes. So when I found this thing that was really kind of self-maintaining and indoors and the kids loved it, it was a lot less work. That, to me, was really cool. And we actually talked about what was going on. The process. So that's the building of the, of the walls, right? Is that right. Okay. So I expect kids to come up with instructions. I expect them to articulate, you know, uh, to write business plans, to write ordinal directions, to come up with proposals, to reach out to people. One of the nicest campaigns is my kids started writing to the Bronx Borough President and got him involved. My kids got involved with the Bronx Can Initiative, which stands for Change Attitudes Now. And clearly in the Bronx, we are poised, ready, willing, and able to change attitudes now. But again, when kids start having good experiences in school and things that they look forward to, it becomes a much better day because sometimes school can be really tough between scanning and metal detectors and, you know, the 90-minute ride and everything else that they're forced to go through during the day. If you can do something that you actually look forward to coming to see every day, and actually, you could put some money in your pocket and send you home with some food and really becomes a fun thing to do. Don't ever underestimate the cool factor. Uh, and this was totally cool. And then you throw in the making money factor. No, that's even better. And then you throw in the fact that you're going to have some academic success. That's even better. And the rest, you know, kind of takes off on itself. I conduct this orchestra. I can't play an instrument of. The cool thing about planting indoors is that you can really get kids on the lower end of the spectrum to be the labor force to do the kind of routine tasks that really a lot of kids don't like to do that generate thousands of plants and, you know, plants you can sell. 
And, and a lot of my kids are coming to me from communities that either have no access to plants or they're English language learners coming from other places where there's a tremendous need for food. So parents get this. A lot of my kids are from the Caribbean and Africa, and uh, I have kids from Haiti who want to send this thing home, which to me is rather remarkable. So let's do it. That's the literacy piece. You know, the math is figuring it all out. Uh, you know, we had to put this thing on wheels, figure out how to get it through doors, how to not have it tip over, um, square footage, volume. You know, I've never had a real working science lab in my life. So when I was able to put 72 plants into a two foot by one foot, six foot high space, that was rather remarkable. I'll be honest, I didn't know I had to pollinate the tomato. You know, they just weren't getting there until we started. So, there, there are, in, in those walls, there's food? Oh, well, yeah, we moved from ornamental walls uh -huh. um, to actually growing food. And that was, that's a game changer because you can sell that food. Mm -hmm. And you can grow it efficaciously, you know, regardless of season. And then it brought in a whole bunch of other stuff like retrofitting and lighting and Con Ed and water, all the kinds of stuff that, listen, my kids are the canaries in the coal mine. They get it better than anybody that, you know, their neighborhood is very different than the Upper East Side. My kids don't need a weatherman to tell you what kids are getting off the Ford train at my stop and what kids are staying on to the Bronx High School of Science. They know all too well long before the train stops. But this is their own little game changer. And, and they're involved, and it's also bringing together very disparate groups of kids around this issue to really talk about it. I mean, it's kind of cool. I got lucky. Listen, I'd like to tell you, you know, I'd like to tell you I have something to sell. I got lucky. It's called hard work and inspiration. I show up every day, and I'm determined to make a difference. And kids still, at the end of the day, respond to that, and I think we all know that. And I'm hearing about, you know, capturing my neighborhood and all kinds of stuff. I want to come to your, I, I want to come to Utah. I mean, I'd love to know what it looks like. Much less take pictures. <laughs> Anytime. Now. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. And that's my right. idea. You know, we're connecting kids, and that's the cool thing, too. The power of this internet is nuts that I have 6,000 kids on Facebook talking about this instead of, you know, if Brianna's getting beaten up by Chris Brown, to me, is totally cool. <laughs> <laughs> cool. You so know, anybody, anybody want to jump in here? Please do. The kids think I'm there all the time, but I'm not. You know, if I dumped you 30 years ago, I don't want to know from you. And I see more teachers get in trouble on Facebook than anybody, so I'm not going there. But let the kids stay there and talk about something positive. They're very accountable to my wife, and I like that. <laughs> you know, Paul, Paul, one of the jokes that I make about um, Stephen is that if you spend just an hour with him, um, you have a better shot of energy than a Red Bull. <laughs> Thanks, and, and listen, I can't say enough about you, and you, you, you young guys really inspire me. <laughs> cool. Anybody have a question or a thought? Stephen, uh, let me ask you to keep going a little bit. You started to talk about um, economic uh, disparity, and but you've worked with uh, you've worked with an affluent school. Um, yeah, that's a game changer. So this is really what's interesting. You know, sadly, New York City is definitely a city of neighborhoods, and there are all kinds of walls that divide us. But I really see those walls and those disparate communities sometimes as little as five miles or 20 minutes apart, but six long degrees of separation is the greatest opportunity in the world because a lot of the resources that those schools of wealth and privilege have, my kids would love to have. And a lot of the um, excitement that my kids, per the perception of their lives, whether it's music or graffiti or art or sports, kids in wealthy neighborhoods would, would love to have. So when you can bring kids together from very different groups to change the way we eat and think about the way we do food and the way we live, that to me is spectacular. So I'm really proud of the partnership that we've developed with um, – the Calhoun School, which is a very progressive and privileged school on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. I mean, you know, it was very funny because most of the kids get there. I mean, it, it's just a very privileged school. And when my kids were talking to kids the other night, um, some of the kids said, well, we have to go. Our driver is here. And my kids turned around and said, well, our driver is here. He's Mr. Ritz. You know, they didn't quite get it. It was one of those beautiful kids moments where kids are just kids, you know. And they said, and the girls were like, well, our driver gets upset if we're late. And they said, well, your driver should be more like Mr. Ritz. He's very patient. You know, and I, I kind of love that. That's a great equalizer to me. But we were able to use their facilities, and they loved working with my kids. My kids loved being ambassadors of the Bronx. 
these kids um, from the Upper West Side actually came to visit and do service learning in my community and really walked away with a sense of gratitude for what they have and for the differences they can make. And we're developing these long-term sustainable relationships that are really going to be game changers because my kids don't have access to a theater. We don't have access to a wood shop. But guess what? Now we do. And that's so kind of what, what's the project with the Calhoun School? Well, we this is Hyde Kids? This is Hyde Kids, and uh, most <laughs> recently we built the stage for the TEDx Theater. You know, last week, the last, you know, one year later, I brought kids from the poorest congressional district in America together with kids in the wealthiest to build a stage that everyone could look at and admire around the world, a perfect example of partnerships, of being creative, and most importantly, really around the way kids eat. Um, because sadly, in my neighborhood, kids may not have a lot of money to eat, and they're eating poorly. And in wealthy neighborhoods, kids have all the money in the world and they're still eating poorly. So we are a nation that is both stuffed and starved. 40% of the food that we are growing in this country winds up in the garbage, which is a tragic shame. And learning about ways that we can impact each other and work together is kind of cool because you know, I have this big vision that you know kids who communicate well with each other may not wind up shooting each other at a later date in life or seeing each other as potential victims. Or you know, And I, I like that. I like being a game changer. Okay. There are lots of people on the uh, line here. Questions, thoughts? I have a question. Good. Scott. Um, I've been experimenting a little bit with, I don't know if you can see my fish tank in the back of, with aquaponics using goldfish and using the water from that to fertilize the plants and water the plants. And, um, solar lighting to power the LEDs for the grow lights. Have you done anything with that? With We've experimented. Um, I'm looking at doing something totally new. Again, I'm at a new school. I'm at K-12, to and I've got a whole lot of responsibilities. But it, I will share with you this. In ret it, so the, the possibilities there are endless, and there are a lot of companies that are really doing amazing things. I just came back from the Green School Conference, and if you've never been to a Green School Conference, you need to go. Um, because it will certainly green your mind, some of the innovative technologies and the way we're looking at not only what we're doing in school, but using buildings as vehicles. Um, you know, I'm also proud to be working with the U.S. Green Building Council because really, you know, we talk about the what, we talk about the who, but we never talk about the where. So some of this place-based learning is fascinating for kids, and using the building and vehicles around it as tools for teaching is critical. Kids love fish. So I've had very li limited experience, but I'm anxious to move into that direction. I did take a bunch of kids on Save a Tilapia uh, trip where we go to Chinatown and we get those tilapia that are destined to be in tanks, and then we re-socialize them to eat. And of course, my kids, what do they want to feed them? Pizza and M&Ms, you know, and uh, so that that's a whole new learning because that's not the kind of stuff that these fish would find naturally in their environment. So for me, it's, it's small steps that lead to bigger steps. Uh, this is going to sound kind of funny coming from me, but I really believe in keeping it small and keeping it simple, and then it gets big quickly, but the small, measurable uh, successes are the best ones you're going to have. But Can you I give us a quick example of that? Well, you know, case in point, I started this green bronze machine with very few kids. People think I set out there to like, change the world and it kind of feels like now I have an army, but it really started with just, you know, a couple of kids who just needed a place to belong. And they knew two other kids and they knew two other kids. I mean, sometimes teachers got, you know, we're charged to do so much. And I think this is the problem. We got test scores, we got this. Um, you know, we've got to upgrade the data, we've got to have the family accountability piece, we've got our grade level team, we've got our, you know, our, our subject area team, our department team, cohort meetings. It's a lot to do. So I wasn't looking for more. I was kind of looking to do it more efficaciously. So I started with kids who I know did, knew needed a place and just had an interest and they knew someone. I think it would be impossible to walk into a classroom with 30 kids and say, yeah, we're going to garden because, you know, Kids would flip me off. I certainly don't, you know, a lot of kids don't want to be in the garden, but you want to get three or four that really love it. And then they know two or three more. And then even if you get uh, a disruptive force within, the greater will of the group kind of conducts it. You know, I have a very benevolent dictatorship. In my class, the kids get 49% of the vote. They think they get 51, but they only get 49. But, you know, of the 49% that they have, they have 100% influence of, of their own. And that, to me, is the most important thing. Cool. Other thoughts? Monica, jump in <laughs> if you'd like. <laughs> um, I 
heard you talk. I love I love all the stuff that you're doing. Um, I heard you talk about um, cures for cancer and all the work that you have to do. So um, this isn't to ignite or inst instigate a debate about the possibilities, but what what could you imagine would happen if you didn't have all those curricular directives and you? And people weren't of the mindset that they were going to end the sentence with, well, did they do well on the test? Oh. Would that's... that be like a magic wand that you're dying to have? No, because I'll tell you, I've become kinder and gentler in my old age. And I think there's some validity to really standardize some standards. So I think, you know, No Child Left Behind really is... is, is really involves some level of no child left inside. Um, and, and I believe strongly in that. But I do think that, you know, you can't let the inmates run the prison. And for a long time, you know, this, the problems that we have today in public education didn't get there overnight. And they're not going to be cured overnight either. You know, I don't need another 12-point plan and another blue ribbon commission to tell me what to do. That said, I do want my kids to feel that they can compete with kids across the country. And one way they can do it is by being prepared to, to do well on tests that rate them against other kids. Now, are the tests biased? Sure they are. Are they culturally insensitive? Sure they are. But I don't think my kids are any less than. We are Americans, Puerto Ricans, Mexicans, African Americans, and we're going to figure out a way to do it. Um, you know, I, 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 I want to raise, uh, I want to raise fields, not just scores. Um, so I want to level, I want to level fields, not just scores. And I think the way you do that is empowering kids to see that they can compete with anybody on any level. That said, you know, the testing madness has got to stop, but <laughs> the content and the curriculum, it, it, it's important. It's important. So, you know, I, I get nervous when teachers say, oh, I'm going to do, would, would you love to do whatever I want? I don't know. I mean, you know, for a long time I was doing whatever I want and I was almost 300 pounds. I had to change a little and now I'm 175. So I think, you know, imposing some controls on your life and some standards to adhere to is not necessarily a bad thing. Hmm. Calorie. Happy medium. We haven't quite figured it out yet and I'm hoping we will. I think really the, the next generation of talented young teachers are going to change that um, with the right support. Valerie, can you check in or not? There can you, you go. Me? We can hear you. We can. Hey. Yeah. What have you been thinking down there? In, um, introduce yourself briefly, please. Valerie Burton from New Orleans, Louisiana. I teach in a failing school. <laughs> so, and you have seniors this year, don't you? Yeah, I've got juniors and seniors this year. Who are really just like the freshmen. I'm extremely surprised. Um, I love Stephen. I want to bottle you up and like bring you home. Well, we want to um, come visit. I'm, I'm working on that. Come on. I'll make room. Definitely. Okay, definitely. I love everything um, about the project and I understand how important it is, especially me coming from a failing school. We've got to connect it to the test score. You know, and I'm loving the literacy aspect in it, even if they write each and every step. They take pictures, they blog, they do whatever. And I mean, your sort of initiative is something that I would love for us to have in our school because it is those sort of projects that pulls in the kids. And it, it makes them do the extra homework. It makes them research and find the videos they need to find and the, the websites they need to find to find the you know the information and the data so thank you very much for all that you do and I hope that where you are now it's a great fit they will not move you to the basement they will put you on in the presidential suite you know and respect all that you bring to our kids well, thank you. What you're gonna, I'm in a four-story building, and the wildest thing is, yeah, I'm working in the basement, and believe it or not, <laughs> classrooms in the basement that don't even have windows. Windows. And one of the things I'm doing is bringing green walls to those basements, um, which is kind of exciting um, in, community, in a community that has very little green. But to me, uh, the tragedy that was and is in New Orleans presents perhaps the greatest challenge of all time, the greatest opportunity, because those kids, if they own this, 
they can rebuild this um, in ways that people have never imagined. Um, I should have my Metro card tie on and, and other stuff that we are really resourcing and upcycling garbage and waste into products that are that are really saleable. And again, part of it is you know you get communities of, of wealth that are next to communities of poverty, and that's a great opportunity to do business. It's a great opportunity to do up value business and upscale business. And you know it's interesting. I have never been as many vegetables as I grow, grow have grown. It wasn't until about three years ago that I went to a Whole Foods because I really had no purpose or no meaning to go to a Whole Foods. And when I walked into Whole Foods with my kids, who traditionally, when they walk into a Whole Foods, they don't look like any other customers. You know, the security comes out like those camera. You see the camera lenses going wah, opening up. You know, and my kids saw green, uh, yellow peppers and orange peppers and red peppers for seven dollars a pound, and a bunch of white folks buying them. And we looked at the green peppers that we had been growing for months, and I thought we were superstars, you know, going for two dollars a pound. The kids turned around and said, "You screwed us." And I said, "Why?" <laughs> you had us growing green peppers. So what was the takeaway? The takeaway was, you know, we never grew green peppers again unless someone wanted to eat them. You know, we're going for high end stuff. I mean. And that's, you know, that's the takeaway is that, you know, you can do this. I mean, I'm fascinated now by Mizuna lettuces, stuff with really, you know, wheatgrass, things you can really turn around and really get kids who need to generate income in short periods of time, short life cycles. And, you know, I can get them in quick enough to make a difference. And then other stuff happens. They start really showing up to school and they start, you know, coming, you know, less, less maligned. Let's put it this way. Kids right. who might have shown up, you know, intoxicated or high or with issues, start just enjoying coming to school. And for kids who start enjoying coming to school who traditionally haven't, that's a game changer for everybody. Now, some teachers aren't ready for that. Um, some teachers aren't ready for kids with tattoos under their eyes to start showing up to school and, uh, and learning and, and wanting to learn. And one of the things I'm learning in a K-12 school, having not been in an elementary school for a long time, is I'm seeing highly proficient kids in second grade who are about the same level as our chronically failed kids in seventh and eighth grade. So I'm realizing that something really goes wrong between grade two and grade seven. You know, I'm really getting back to the fundamentals of learning and realizing that I have a bunch of eighth graders who are nothing more than second graders. And how can I fix that? And if I can fix that at a younger age, I'm going to save all of us across the country a whole bunch of time, energy, and effort. And I like it. You're trying to turn them into enthusiastic sixth graders, is what you're trying. Absolutely. To say. If I can have a whole bunch of, I, and listen, you guys are doing it to me. You know, I'm ready to go back to work now. And I was there at six thirty this morning. You know, I do got to get, <laughs> but I won't. You know, I mean, I'm that kind of guy. So thank you for all the work you are doing. You guys in New yeah. Orleans are real heroes, national heroes, and the internet allows us to acknowledge it. I'd love to connect your kids with mine via one of these conversations, and they'd be able to facilitate it during school hour with greater facility than I ever could imagine. Keep talking. We're going to have to make it happen. Cool beans. Have your kids like mine on Facebook. They'll love it. Thank you. No, thank you. Well, I, yeah, you know, there are lots of political realities that we can't get into uh, about New Orleans and charter schools, and you're in a charter school now, Stephen, and so, you know, how how we can impact on public education is still the big question that I think we can't let go of. You know, I mean, Nathaniel Turner, um, who uh, runs uh, the Blair School, um, does grocery at Blair, something like that, <laughs> sorry, I'll, I'll get that right in a second, down there in New Orleans um, and does a lot of growing and so forth, um, was was recently in Philadelphia at, the, um, at Educon, and one of the things he said is that he's seeing, this is his description, um, that in New Orleans, the, the charter schools push the kids out when they start failing, um, uh -huh. you know, and then, and then, you know, um, and then eventually they they end up at his school, or but only a few of them do, you know. So, uh, Valerie, do you want to say something about that? They either I, end up at they end up at his school or my school, and hmm. it's you know it's true. Charter school is a wonderful thing, but my question is, what about the rest of them? You know, because I really do have nineteen year old juniors who. You know, have two jobs, reek of weed, have two ch kids mm -hmm. who, you know, they're not going to make it at the charter school. They'd make it a week, and then the people would send them a letter and say bye-bye, and then they'd come to me. You know, and we just do them such a disservice. I don't know. 
So yeah, with, with, with one minute left, I thought I'd bring that up. But 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 I, I but but I do feel like I do feel like it's important to celebrate these wonderful um, people like Stephen, and and then also recognize the political realities that we're all working in, and and kind of try to bring it back into the public sphere as, as much as we can. Hey, David, do you have any thoughts about that? Who me? Yeah. Oh, I sure do. Listen. All of you guys are compelling people, and, and this is what you need to do. You need to stay compelled to do what you feel compelled to do within the context of what needs to be done. Um, so if you make your principles happy, if you, stick, if you find a creative way to integrate that which moves you and possesses you, um, and tie it to the curriculum, you're going to be fine. Listen, if I had to eat this computer to ensure that my kids would succeed in school, I would find a way to do it. I understand, however, that I would do it. They'd watch me, and then they'd want to see me do it again. <laughs> and it would do nothing. So finding a way to connect that to what needs to be done to understand that why I can't eat this computer if I tried would probably be the more logical way to go. And I could do it biologically. I could do it mathematically. I could do it, you know, in an argument, in an essay, in a step-by-step -step thesis. And that's the, that's the key to school. That's the key to school. So teachers need to have some fun, but you need to do what needs to be done. Then that's rooted in the curriculum. And if you do that, we're going to be fine. Stephen, did, did, um, I heard some of this, but I often hear you talking about food and eating and health, and then I heard you mention that you've lost a lot of weight at some point in your life. No, did, not just recently. I've gained and lost right. tons of weight, like probably 500 pounds in the last 10 years, and I just got really tired, so I lost 100 pounds this year. So what, was it your interest and passion in all of that that led to um, bringing that to the students or well, it, was it all sort of that. happened together? Yeah, It's some of the love that I have for my family, but also I, I didn't want to be looking like a liar. The flip side is I was driving uh, 15 miles and paying a $12 toll to go to New Jersey for a 99 cent hamburger. You know, they didn't want to be out at a McDonald's talking about good food. And at that point, it, it just seemed like ridiculous, you know, to be doing that. It's certainly not sustainable. Um, so, you know, I tell the kids they can, you know, change their underwear, but they can't change their jeans. So make sure you have on clean underwear and take very good care of your jeans. You know, um, there are a lot of strikes that are born against us. And I'm looking at some of the health problems that are existent in my family. And I don't know how I got to 275 this time around. I guess it was one pound at a time. But this time around, I was determined to do it. And I was determined to do it the way I talk about doing school. Do one thing smart. You know, do one thing simple and start connecting those dots. So for me, it was just a, a series of small, very manageable changes that led up to something that, you know, has brought sexy back. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds like you're modeling for the kids, too, which is great. Right. I, I can talk about, I mean, I was big. I mean, I didn't realize how big I am. This year, I held up the shirt of Ted that I wore last year. The thing was a tent. And, you know, to think that I was going in there saying, you know, be healthy, eat happy, eat healthy. I was eating myself to death on the 99-cent menu, let me tell you. And cheap food is mighty damn expensive, particularly in, color, in communities of, of, of poverty, um, because we all know where those kids get primary health care. Yeah. yeah, I've heard it said that the United States is the only place where the poor people are fat. Right, for sure. Uh, I have a question for Najib before we go, too. I mean, we've been talking about the U.S. and uh, – diet and and that kind of thing in in green schools and does that resonate with what you're in Venezuela right or yes does any does this resonate with your experience I've been this is my first year in, in Venezuela I've been an international teacher for six years I worked in Jordan before that um, and it really depends on the, the the country for example in Jordan it was always easier to interact with the community um, with the high rate of crime here in Venezuela it's it's quite difficult to reach out to, to different sectors. Um, some of the stuff that the school has done is, is built in like a, a garden but that's run by parents and elementary kids. Uh, it's quite difficult to get experts uh, to come in or have kids actually go out and buy the raw materials and sort of look for promotions. Um, but it is very inspiring. Um, I think one thing that they can that you know, I can suggest maybe after doing this is, you know, get on Google Hangout and get on Skype and, and reach out that way uh, as a means of, of just expanding horizons. I have a question um, for Stephen, just out of curiosity. What, what was the, um, the response from parents that um, 
mm. that you've got. Parents love it, and I'll tell you why. Because most of my kids are being raised by granny, and most of my kids come to me from communities that really respect food. Food is love, you know. So what do we do when we want to love our kids? We feed them more. Um, but when you can grow culturally relevant food for kids in communities that have no access to it and send it home for free, ooh, you're a game changer. So I have gang kids who, you know, when they get arrested, the parents don't call me. Someone pops up pregnant, no one calls me. I send the kid home, the gang kid home with a bag of cilantro, and the mom's on the phone because they think that their kid is robbing the Korean green grocer and they're going to have a bunch <laughs> of Chinese people burning down their building. So, you know, and then when you turn around and tell the parent the kid really did that, and you can come have as much as you want. Well, guess what? The parent shows up at school. I get to sign them off on the homework. I get to offer them a continuum of other services. So when I started feeding grandparents and parents and, you know, like literally open school night, I was on a campus of 3,000 kids. On open school night, maybe we get 100 parents. My farmer's market, I was getting 500 parents. And the big question is, do you take food stamps? And the answer is, yes, we can. So that's a game changer, you know, and the kids are growing the food. So we are growing ourselves into a whole new economy, which is rather remarkable. I'm um, talking right. about kids from the Mideast. It's crazy. I get that. Now I'm hearing from places in the United Arab Emirates that really want to support the work that I'm doing there and support kids here. Um, and that's the power of you guys with the power of the Internet. I mean, please, you know, I, I say it almost shamelessly and self-promotingly, not that I'm on Facebook, but – I've been offered a lot of incentives by businesses that if I can, can unite more kids on Facebook, um, they're willing to get involved. I'm starting to hear from some big corporations that want to make a difference. So please get all your kids to like us on Facebook and talk about where you're from. Um, you know, the kids will get back to you. And uh, keep spreading the TED Talk around. It really seems to have generated interest and penetrated markets I never imagined. Last week I spoke at Greenbiz, got a standing ovation. Uh, and that was a bunch of suits because at the end of the day, if we keep our kids out of jail, they are going to be customers, consumers, and employees for life. Unless, of course, you're in the corrections industry. But, you know, we can move on. You know, it's time for us to move beyond this niche issue of red states and blue states and move to uh, green states where we can live ecologically and eloquently in nature, uh, with nature. And that, to me, is what it's all about, and really foster a whole new economy and sense of inclusiveness. But connecting my kids with kids around the world is wild. When my kids in the South Bronx wanted to start donating food and, and technology to Haiti, that's when I said, wow, this is special. And if my kids are, you know, in the South Bronx could do it, you know, wealthy kids can do it. And, and that's the power of what you guys are doing on the internet. I don't get out there much because I'm somewhat myopic. I mean, I'm having a blast right now because, you know, it's fun talking to the choir. Um, but, you know, other than that, I'm very myopic. You know, I tend to do my work and stay to it. I let the bloggers blog. But at the end of the day, you know, I, I want to be in class doing the work, touching kids, touching teachers, and then find out about it when I get called into the principal's office. Do you kids really do that? You know, I, I like those kind of moments, and I'll live for that. But spread the word, please. You know, if we could get a couple of thousand more likes, I'll be able to come to New Orleans for free. Trust me. And I'm already looking at that. So, you know, the power of Facebook, the power of Twitter, the power of, of spreading this, this talk and really posting on it is really attracting a lot of attention. I'm kind of under some NDAs right now, so I can't talk. But trust me, if we do this, we can do this collectively and collaboratively, and I, I want to share it with the world. Well, we're going to leave that as, as our summary comments here, I think. Um, thank you so much um, for coming into the Internet here tonight on The Hangout. Um, I do want to say that um, we, we do this every Wednesday night, and we invite you to come back anytime you'd like. And, Stephen, um, I'm not far from you, so I'm going to be calling you up and uh, seeing what, what other kinds of connections we can make um, as we go here. Um, one of the um, things I like to say here at the end is we'd like to thank uh, Dave Cormier and Jeff Lebo, who set up this channel, uh, edtechtalk.com at the World Bridges Network. And this, uh, this video goes live pretty fast, within about a half an hour, um, and then it goes up on teachersteachingteachers.org as well as a podcast. So, um, Stephen, can you mention um, where to find the Green Machine? What's the URL for that? Um, oh, boy. That's <laughs> okay. Out now. okay, Green, I think it's, what is it? Face Just Green Bronx Machine on Facebook. Um, what's that, www.facebook.com? Uh, People can search it. If they look yeah. for the, the the Green Bronx machine on Google, on Facebook, they'll find it. Yeah, go to Facebook um, and like the TED Talk. Go to TED.com, the big TED site. Search my name, Stephen, uh, Stephen Ritz, R-I-T-Z, S-T-E-P-H-T-N. 
And, uh, you know, share it, show it. I'm, I'm told it's being shown at Teach for America now. Uh, this weekend I'm speaking at Washington University. Uh, you know, the power, listen, this is our moment. We can do this. And what do we want? You know, we want uh, more schools and less jails, more books and less guns, more learning and less vice. We want, you know, more justice and less revenge. And, and collectively, we can do this. My specialty is working with kids. Your specialty is getting the message out there. This gentleman on the left in Utah, his specialty is having kids take pictures. Um, you know, Nikhil was here before. God, I love that. I met that young kid and I felt 50 years younger and wanted to go do two sessions of teaching a day. And that's what it's about. You know, engage your passion. Share your passion. Come competent. Come strong. Um, be prepared to get knocked down, but also be prepared to get back up. And that's what it's about. You know, if it was easy, everyone would be doing it, but it's not. But we are Americans. My mama didn't raise a can't. Um, you know, we are African-Americans, Puerto Ricans, Mexicans, you know, and uh, it's time for America to get back to an indigenous people again. We can do this. We need to. Thank you so much, Stephen. Um, but, and we want to say good night to everyone. Thank you all for coming by. Um, Joel, uh, thank you. <laughs> um, and we'll continue this as we go. Good night. Great. Good night. Thanks. Hey, thank you. Thanks, Paul, Thanks. for reaching out. What a pleasure. New Orleans. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see you down there. Make some.